Hello, everyone. My name is Kamala, Kamala Solaili. I'm going to talk to you today about belonging as an Arab Muslim Canadian who also happens to be gay. These are two identities that are often seen as incompatible at best and sometimes antagonistic to each other. But I want to start, I want to start with two scenes. I want to start with, I'm going to bookend, I'm sorry, I'm going to bookend my talk with two scenes. The first one, the opening scene, was right here in London, Ontario, 20 years ago. There was an event hosted by the Canadian Arab Federation. I think it was something about the next generation of Arab Canadians. So 20 years ago, I was the next generation of Arab Canadians. And it has one of those sort of lovely titles like lifting the veil or, or breaking stereotypes. You know, one of those cliches that my community just loves to, to kind of to prove that we're people too. So I think I was, I was clearly the token gay in, on that panel. I was frightened because I had never been so publicly out in my community until that, that evening. The panel itself went really well. You know, most people on the panel either tolerated or ignored me altogether. So, you know, nothing, nothing really happened. But when I went back to my hotel room, I was followed by a group of young Muslim and Arab men who wanted to lecture me on my errant ways. It turned to a very violent confrontation with homophobic slurs and religious sermons. I locked myself in, called security, and yet they kept knocking at my door. The thing I did immediately was to call, I mean, was to book, to book my uh, return ticket first thing, first thing the next morning, even though I was supposed to spend the day in London, Ontario. I mean, they probably weren't from London, Ontario, anyway. They're probably some hooligans from Toronto, anyway. <laughs> So um, if I had any lingering doubt about separation between my gay identity and my ethnic one, that encounter certainly put it to rest. My place in the world, my sense of belonging from that moment on would be with the LGBT community. For someone of my age, I'm 53 now, that was the only option we had. We belonged in one camp or another. Like many gay men who came from the so-called visible minority or ethnic background, I've, I've often felt I had to make a choice. It's either my native language, my culture, and my religion, or my sexuality. Then 9-11 happens. The community that I turn my back on is under suspicion, under threat. I'm under suspicion, I'm under threat. The community that I embraced is largely white and is not above engaging in same acts of racism. Being gay, after 9-11 I discovered, does not absolve you from other forms of prejudice. Once again, I have to face the challenge of choosing side, or at least keeping one foot in each camp, never feeling entirely safe or welcome in one or the other. I was a theater critic at the Globe and Mail. I've seen hundreds of plays about, from multicultural theater companies exactly about that theme. I used to make fun of them, and then I suddenly realized why they, why they always go on about not belonging in one world or another. But funny how it, what a decade or two can change. For younger generation of from members of the LGBT community, this separation is no longer tenable. Many of them want the people they love, they sleep with, and the families they come from at the same table. Nobody wants to live a compartmentalized life the way, the way I did and my generation did. But the question I ask, I ask you tonight, can communities that historically either reviled or ignored one another learn to work together outside of progressive, pockets of progressive groups? Now, it is easy for me to go to a progressive community, Muslim community and feel at ease. It's easy for me to go to a pro progressive queer community and feel at ease. But the challenge is, can I go to a suburban mosque with my partner? And is it safe for me as a Muslim or Arab gay man to go on dating apps without getting either fetishized or turned down from the no femme, no people of color white men? At the very least, there's a conversation on the way. A year ago, I supervised the master's project about the Unity Mosque, a progressive queer mosque in downtown Toronto and in other, in other parts of the country. It was done by one of my former students, now my former student, 
and he was a convert to Islam, who wasn't himself gay, but he was curious and wanted to, um, to and he did a terrific story. By the way, he applied for the Walrus Fellowship, so make sure he, he I'll tell you his name later. So um, I'm, I wrote him a reference letter. So I'm feeling very positive and optimistic that someone like him can actually write a story about the queer Muslim community. That was in June, he, he's done in June, it was done in early June, and then on June 12, you may remember, on the morning of Sunday, June 12, I woke up to the um, news that um, there was a, a shooting at the Pulse nightclub in Florida. I knew, I knew, my heart just told me, the killer's gonna be Muslim and brown. But what I didn't expect is that the club itself had a, th a Latin theme night, and most of the people, most of the victims were black and brown, gay, lesbian, and trans people. It was a dark day, certainly for the victims and, and their survivors, and for the LGBT community in general, because here we are in 2016, we can still be killed for our basic desire to love, to dance, to celebrate a Saturday night with our friends. But for everyone who, like me who identifies as gay and also happens to be Muslim, the backlash on social media was fierce. And once again, I felt compelled to take sides. This time I took the, the Muslim community sides because I, side because I felt they needed, they needed the support more. But I also wonder, is there an opportunity in tragedy? Both religious and sexual minorities can understand that in times of stress, both of them can become, can be thrown under the campaign bus. Look at what's happening south of the border. A Pew Research Center survey uh, in the US uh, conducted this year found that 52% of US Muslims now say homosexuality would be accepted, should be accepted by society. By contrast, only 34% of white evangelical Protestants believe believe the same. Which brings me to my closing scene. Last week, a former executive of the, of the Canadian Arab Foundation, the same foundation that, ha that held the uh, event here, uh, federation, sorry, that held the event here in, in uh, London, Ontario 20 years ago, invited me to another event in Toronto. I said, ugh, here we go again. But it was a fundraiser. And the real reason he invited me is that he was trying to set me up with one of his closest friends. <laughs> his matchmaking skills suck, but there, but there is hope, my friend, there is hope. Thank you.